What I'd like to do tonight is a, a kind of exercise in critical thinking that um, I think that is important for Christians to display in the world. Um, I grew up in a, in a divided household. <laughs> uh, my grandfather, uh, who ra- my grandmother and grandfather raised me, and my grandfather was a cradle Presbyterian who went to war and, ne- and never went to church when he came back. And my grandmother was a converted Methodist who was converted when he went to war. And uh, she, she had an opinion about just how things ought to be done. You know, like capital all, capital O, oughta, capital B, B, capital D, done. Catch it? And unfortunately, we lived in Texas, which was the land of uh, Southern Baptists, Primitive Baptists, Independent Baptists, um, General Baptists, all fine people and other pagans. And she didn't always approve. And so we lived in this household (laughs) where, um, uh, well, long long story short, I didn't always go to Sunday school. Uh, sometimes it just wasn't safe to go there and come back. And so I didn't learn everything that I should have learned in, in maybe the Presbyterian church or some other church that if I had attended, I would have become intelligent. I had to wait until after college before I could learn some of the things I do. And so my understanding of the Gospels is, uh, or was, kind of limited. In particular, Luke was a really good doctor He went and interviewed Jesus' mother, and so that's how he got the story about how Jesus was born. And he was there when when nobody else was there at Paul's death. And beside that, he was just a good storyteller. Yeah. What I have come to think, or what I've come to realize since then, is that he gave us um, an incredible insight into what it was like to be living in in the first century church. And he writes this story that is absolutely genius. Of course, it starts in Luke 1, uh, the the Gospel of Luke, right? And in in the Gospel of Luke, it imitates the Gospel of Matthew. Um, And they both imitate Mark. They kind of enlarge on the themes. They tell the story. But basically, the stories are the same. It seems like they are gathered together from one source. And then Matthew... This is one of our five retired you know to, pastors. You know how to turn the video on? So he was... Um, uh, Luke, in his own special way, was different than Matthew and built on Mark. It's sort of the way... I've been taught that it was done. Matthew finishes with this glorious uh, statement uh, where Jesus tells everyone to go into all the world and create disciples and um, uh, baptize and teach them everything that he has taught them. And Luke does it entirely different than Matthew. Luke writes the, the, the story of the Acts of the Apostles. So his Volume 2 is the Acts of the Apostles that we are talking about uh, in, this, in this course that uh, Pastor Jim and Pastor Tyler have set up. But what I want to do with this text is, particularly as um, I've been asked to focus on the council in Jerusalem, is I want to show how um, insightful and how brilliant Luke was when he wrote the book. Not only does he tell you about the grace of Jesus Christ, but he tells you in in um, a way that uh, tells us what life was really like in the first century church and gives us insight into how we can behave in the second century church. I mentioned the part about my divided household because um, when I was growing up, because there were ways of doing things that were inherent in the household. I lived in my grandparents' house, and so I was always a guest. 
I never actually moved in, you know, because any moment now, maybe my dad would come and pick me up and we would go into the horizon together. Um, but I learned that there were ways to do things and those ways were very important. They're still in my life now. Uh, for instance, one evening, or um, we didn't often go to church, as I said, uh, but I can remember one special occasion, and it was uh, special because the, uh, in my memory, the relish tray was out. That tells me that this little, in, this little moment that we were having, this little party, all those people that there were at the house, were not just family, but they were oh, my, uh, my grandfather's friends from the officer's club, my grandmother's friends from the, from the church, and, and some mixture from the neighborhood. Because my grandmother didn't put out the relish tray unless it was special company. And I remember a moment when uh, all those beautiful people were standing around. There weren't very many kids. That's why I was in the, in the room with them in the, in, the, uh, in the living room, in the family room, in the dining room with them. Because I was a kid, maybe 10 years old, 11 years old, not very old, certainly bored to tears with all those adults. But I had to be there because I was a little bit on display and there were no other kids my age in the room. And it had to be a Sunday because um, while we were sitting there minding our own business, I was minding my own business, playing with the olives and the carrots and the, and the, and the celery, as you do. Um, I figured that it would be really important for me to show off some of the stuff that I'd learned in science school that morning. But I hadn't learned very much in that science school class. I had, it was a mm, sixth grade, seventh grade boys class in the Baptist church, the boys were separated from the girls, particularly in middle school. And I remember the core, the, the most important thing that happened that day was that the teacher told us about circumcision. And I had no idea what circumcision was. And so what do you do when you are 11 years old and there's a bunch of adults standing around? You ask an adult, what is circumcision? And, you know, it's one of those moments when the room went silent. And there was this sort of, kind of like now, there was this sort of deafening roar. As I realized that sometimes there are things that you say, and sometimes there are things you don't say. And sometimes there are um, uh, special occasions and you work extra hard for those occasions. And, and then there are other times when, uh, you can kind of let your hair down a little bit and you can be a little more casual. Um, this was two or three years before the summer of love. <laughs> Not that I was old enough to understand what that meant, but it meant that Saturday nights was the night that you could smell the ironing and the starch in my cotton uh, uh, collared shirt ready for the tie. And you could smell the smell of shoe polish as we were getting ready for Sunday morning. At least that's what's in my head when I think about those days. Um, I learned in that little vignette that there are ways that things got done in the Malar household that weren't done in other people's house. And there was a time to say things not at parties. And then there were other times when it would have been okay to ask that question. All right. Long story to tell you that that's a little bit of what we want to uh, describe, a little bit of the critical thinking that I would like us to be thinking about when we ad address the book of Acts. Um, I've been asked to talk about the uh, Council of Jerusalem, and there's evidence in this text that the Church of Jerusalem, the Church of Antioch, the Church, the young church that that wasn't 20 years old yet, midway between the um, resurrection of Jesus and the destruction of the temple. It was a time when Jerusalem was hyper-nationalistic, growing more and more nationalistic every day. They were more and more resentful of the invasion and the uh, depredation that the, that the Romans were creating their own class elites were uh, creating. And 
um, Luke wants to explain how the Christian church fought, how they coped, and how they survived so that you and I today can become, well, I, I don't, as I look across the board, how many of us are Jewish? But because of the grace that happened at the Jerusalem Council, because of the way that the church made its decisions, the way that it behaved towards each other, uh, put us in, in a line so that we could become Christians. Um, so I want us to think a little bit about that. Would you, if you've got a Bible, if you want to, you can read along with me, but I'm gonna to try to read uh, Acts 15, and I wanna show you some things that uh, are not uh, always present or not always in the front of our mind when we are looking at the book of Acts, okay? Um, of course, at the last minute, I made a change to what I was going to say to you, and so consequently, the paper isn't uh, ready. Here's Acts 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, read, they had a very hot argument. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and uh, Samaria. I'm going to tell you in a little bit about how Antiochus sits there on the bay at the, at the mouth of the Orontes River. And if I show you a map, I hope that's the right direction on your, uh, uh, on your screen. My screen sometimes turns things backwards. But if that was, was a map of, um, of Asia Minor up here, Asia Minor up here, and the coastline down to Jerusalem, somewhere down here. The Antioch is there at the intersection of what is today, what is today modern Turkey, and right there in what is today Syria, right in that corner. And that's about 800 miles north. Yes, um, 800 miles. Can't remember it's miles or kilometer. About the distance from Silverdale to San Francisco is the distance from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem down here, up to the, um, up to the, to do Antioch. And so this text tells us that um, Paul didn't go by the Mediterranean down to Jerusalem. What he did is he fo followed the uh, coastline down from the Orontes up where Antioch was, all the way down to uh, Jerusalem, which was a little inland. So they went through Phoenicia and uh, Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers, I'm presuming, in Phoenicia and Samaria. When they came to Jerusalem, they were uh, welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, that is to say, some people who were Christians in the church at Jerusalem, uh, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. A rather hot, rather direct, blunt uh, order that in order for people to be followers of Christ, they also had to be followers of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, my guess is it didn't happen that afternoon. It was a long conversation, maybe, maybe over days and, and maybe even weeks. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you 
that by my mouth the Gentiles should have the word of the gospel, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he had done to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. <clears throat> after they finished, after they finished speaking, James, the brother of Jesus, important, very important person in the life of Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem church, James replied, brothers, listen to me. I think what he's doing is he's talking to the Pharisee class or the Pharisee people in the church and letting the uh, Christians from Antioch listen in. Simeon has related how God um, first visited the Gentiles. Simeon is James' way of putting Paul in his place. I don't mean unkindly. But he's telling everybody in the church that Simeon is Simon P Peter. Does that make sense? He's not using Peter, the, Ro the Roman name or the Greek name. He's not even using Simon, the anglicized Greek name. He's calling him Simeon, which is to say he's my brother, my Jewish brother. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles. <clears throat> And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ru ruins, and I will restore it, that the um, redeemed, sorry about that, that the that the remnant of mankind may love the Lord. And the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known for all. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who um, turn to God, but should uh, write to them to abstain from things that are, uh, that are, polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from the strangulation of, of animals and of blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who practiced him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. A whole bunch in there that I would like you to look at. I would like you to see. Um, I'm having problems with me, uh, my eyes. I'm having problems reading. And so consequently, I apologize. Um, I'm not going to read any more of the scriptures. But what I want to do is I want to tell you some of the antecedents to this story so that we get an idea of what uh, first uh, Paul is talking about, Paul and Barnabas, what Peter is advocating and what um, James puts his imprimatur on. Um, and this leads to, I mean, this comes from the description that Luke, that Luke tries to show us in the way that he tells the story. Remember when um, Jesus was with his disciples just before he ascended into heaven. Um, it, the, Luke tells us that they were gathered there maybe for breakfast or for some dinner together. And um, as they were talking about the food and pre preparing things, the disciples walked up to Jesus and said to them, to Jesus, 
are you now going to um, restore Israel? And that's the first, like, critical thing that I want you to look at when you are uh, reading the, the, the Gospels and when you're reading Acts, is that we tend, to, in this day and age, to think of Jews and Israelites as kind of like the same people. They're all gathered in there together, and sometimes you use um, uh, Jews, and sometimes you use Israelite, and it's kind of like sometimes calling people Americans, and other times calling them um, I don't know, citizens, maybe uh, 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 patriots. It's just another way that we talk to each other, or talk about each other. But actually, there's quite a difference between the way that uh, Luke uses Israelite and he uses Jew. It, to Luke, Jews are people who live in Judea and come who are descended from Judah, who was the fourth son of Israel. And they were a group of people who largely came back from, um, from exile three or four hundred years earlier, and they were trying to establish a new state that looked like David's old kingdom, Solomon's old kingdom. And so they, these people who came back, these exiles came back, they came back with the idea that they were going to out perform their fathers, their ancestors. It's kind of like uh, the reason why Leavenworth is such an attractive place to go. You know, they out Bavaria, Germany. They make, everything's done more there, more so there. I mean, they don't just do uh, Lederhosen and, and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Bratwurst, but they do it in style. And so when you listen to the Gospels writing about the Jews, they're talking about that group of people who thought of Jerusalem as sort of a, of a center of the universe and a kind of a tourist attraction for their God. And with all the panoply, all the, uh, all the excitement, all the, all the accoutrements that, that came with that, including like a temple, which was supposed to be the very place where God put his foot down, excuse me, where God put his foot down. On the other hand, people who lived in Galilee, or maybe even Samaria, people who lived around the rest of, of Israel, or the Israelites, they weren't Jewish so much. They thought of themselves as the leftover or the remnant of maybe Benjamin, or Ephraim, or uh, um, Naphtali or Gad or those people who had survived somehow even even the destruction uh, by Assyria and then later the destruction by B Babylon maybe intermingling with the the Gentiles that came in and moved in they shared their when they when they shared the the love of God that their ancestors had had it was different and sometimes uh, maybe they, only, they had their own kinds of piety, they had their own ways of doing things, but it was different than the, the showmanship that, or at least in their own minds, it was different, done differently than the way that it was done in Judea. And so consequently, like sometimes we look down our noses at other communities in the county or nearby. We look down our noses to the, uh, I don't know, Nobody here does this, I'm sure. But have you ever heard a criticism of Bainbridge Island? Or have you ever heard about somebody in Belfair? I once remember a client who was just horrified that I had to kick, that he had to, to come to my office in Bremerton because of all the crime that was there in Bremerton and all the bad people that were there. And, you know, he was from Port Orchard, so you could understand why there would be this impression. So it was like a group of people who were fussing with each other about the other. And um, Jesus' disciples were largely from that group of people. And they wanted to know if Israel would be pulled back together. And yeah, it might be okay to do it under the house of David. But they wanted to know if Jesus was going to bring that back. And he said, I'm not going to do it the way you expect. It's going to be quite different than you expect. 
let's move on quickly because I'm already uh, behind. Um, and then Luke flows through his conversation, his description of how things are all the way to the middle of the book, the middle story of the uh, Jerusalem Council. And he tells story after story after story about how Jesus' um, ministry went from Jerusalem to Samaria, or to, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the other ends of the earth. And he does it brilliantly. Almost immediately after the, um, the conversation of the, of the descent of the, um, well, almost immediately in time, you know, it's weeks, uh, there's Pentecost. The, uh, at the time of Pentecost, people's story about how things came to be the way they is, is um, full of the story as the prophets told it. The prophets said that the reason why the Jews had to go into exile was because of idolatry. Idolatry that meant that um, people turned away from God and God's presence had, had left the temple. Uh, tucked away in Ezekiel, kind of in Z Ezekiel 10, is this little strange story about how um, the Spirit of God, which was resting up above the wheels inside of wheels, just took off one day and uh, went up into the sky and crossed the threshold of the temple and went east. And it was like a, a thing in the people in the people's minds, the people who were trying to put their head around why Rome was in charge, why Greece was in charge, why these people who betrayed Yahweh were in charge. And one of the stories that they told themselves was they're, because of the uh, idolatry of th their forefathers, the spirit had left them, had left the temple. And even though Herod had built the temple, the spirit was gone, which meant, you know, it's kind of like sometimes you go to church and, sorry, this never happens while Tyler is preaching, or Jim for that matter, but uh, sometimes you go to church and the spirit's just not there. I mean, you know, he just doesn't seem to be there. If the music's not right, uh, the scripture didn't mean anything today, or maybe it's just me that feels like that. But if you just shake your head, yes, if you... Uh, if you've ever had that experience where the spirit just didn't seem to be there and all the pretty uh, colors and all the expensive doodads that people used to do, the smells, the, the, the sounds, the, even, even the way the wind blew through the, through the uh, temple precincts, it just didn't feel like the spirit was there. Not like in the day when Solomon dedicated the temple and it slayed people to the floor. So, the promise was, someday, the Spirit will come back. The promise of the prophets was, someday, the Spirit will reanimate his people. That's what Pentecost was. Was the day, according to the people who were there in the room and listening in, and people, not just uh, the local Jewish um, uh, locals, but people from Parthia and from uh, Media and from uh, Cyprus and from the the Greek islands and from uh, down in Egypt way and uh, even as far over as Libya and people uh, down from the uh, Araba or down in Arabia, people all over the world speaking all kinds of languages because that's where they lived and that was how people did it, were there when the Spirit came back, this deadness that had been in the temple now is living alive in these people who are living in Jerusalem. And it was mind-boggling to the people who were living in, uh, at that time, who were living in Jesus, that what they thought was the restoration of Israel could show up like this, where everything was in common, where people were taking care of each other, where there was love that seemed to over... Uh, overflow uh, in ways that took care of high and low, old and young, uh, uh, Hebrew and Hellenists. Everybody was included. 
that's the first way that it seems that, yeah, Jerusalem is being affected. And then the next story that Luke tells is the story about how um, the Hellenists realized that the Hebrew people living in community there in Jerusalem, in this wonderful new church thing, it began to dawn on them that there still was this difference, this distinction between the way the Hebrew widows and the way that the, the, uh, the Hellenistic widows. That is to say, people who were doing it, the ways um, families with long ties to Jerusalem and uh, all of the all of the expectations and the comfort level of living in the shadow of the temple and, and the way things is supposed to be done. Those people were noticing that there was a difference between the way they were treated and maybe the guy whose family came in from, I don't know, even Tarsus or coming in from uh, up Phoenicia or coming from out of town. They noticed that, there was a difference. Um, Luke isn't explicit on what that difference looked like, but he is really clear that there grew to be a problem, and there was a lot of complaining to the apostles, like, do something. you got to fix this. And the assembly, I thought, was wise. Instead of telling the pastor he had to do one more thing, or the apostles, that there was just a, a small list that they had to take care of in addition to all the other things, you can tell that the spirit really was there. Uh, the, the, the assembly said, you know, it, it wouldn't be wise for the apostles to turn from prayer and to writing this, um, the sermons and taking care of each other uh, in ex exposing and teaching the, the scriptures. So what we ought to do is we ought to get a group of people who can do all those functions and pay attention to the needs of the Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking people, and make sure that what they are getting, the way that they are treating, is as lovely as the way that people apparently were treating the Hebrew widows and children. And so um, Luke tells the story about how these men, yeah, they were men, who were assigned to be deacons, deacons, who would um, do the ministry and take care of the population, the distribution of food and making sure that people that, who were sick were being cared for, you know what a deacon does. But what we don't always notice when we're reading that list of the deacons is that they didn't put anybody in position whose name was Simeon. They didn't put in a Reuben. They didn't put in a Judah or a, or a James. What they did is they put in people whose names were Stephen and Prochorus. I always like that one because uh, it clearly was not somebody who was pro music ensemble. It was just, I can't hear you laughing. I hope that was funny. Um, there were other names like Nicanor and, uh, dear me, I can't get them all in my head. But there are Greek names and we just read them real fast or maybe we don't read them very well. And so we don't think about them. We try to get through it as fast as possible, kind of like reading the names in a news article. But every single one of those names is the Greek name. They were a batch of Hellenists. They were, if they were Jewish, they were Jewish people who were more comfortable with the way that the Greeks did it than they were, uh, than they were comfortable with the way that the Pharisees did it or the Sadducees, for some, for instance. Does that make sense to you? And it seems to me that in that moment they be, they realized that including people was much more important than um, separating people off into little categories, into little boxes, and telling them that, um, or allowing them to be left out, or being essentially the, the, the size and the location of the church grew from just being about Jerusalem and just being about Judea, but it was also being including those people who were living outside the precincts. And then the next story that uh, Luke tells is the story of how Philip was one of the people who was invited to be the deacon. 
And Philip was called to um, first preach in Samaria. And he was as stunned as anybody else when the people behaving in Samaria behaved like the people who were there at Pentecost. The, the experience of the Samaritans was the same. And Philip was part of that. And he brought back word, you know, eventually brought back word that the spirit, the spirit that had been in the temple that had, um, it seemed like abandoned Jerusalem to the depredations of the, of the Babylonians had gone ahead of them to Babylon and had come back but not in the way that they wanted him to come. They didn't manage the spirit the way that, that uh, th uh, they couldn't manage the spirit the way that they wanted to. He was quite different. So the story tells something really, really interesting about um, what happens next after they go to Samaria. While Philip is in Samaria, he suddenly see, is transported he, to this uh, trip. Remember I showed you this, uh, map of here is Asia Minor and then Antioch up here and then down the, down the coastline. We're going to go through Phoenicia and we're going to uh, come a little bit further to Jerusalem, which is going to be inland. Well, for some reason, Philip is transported to the coastline again and where he uh, runs along the street into Gaza. Today's Gaza is where the Palestinian state um, uh, tries to describe its independence from the, uh, the state of Israel. But Philip is transported to Gaza uh, on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And while he's there, he meets this person who is apparently dressed quite officially and seems to be well-to-do, certainly well enough to be in a, uh, a chariot, some kind of wheeled contraption. And the, um, he's reading aloud from Isaiah, and he's trying to figure it out. What in the world is this Isaiah saying? So Philip goes up to him and asks if he could be helpful. Conversation. Philip is clear that Jesus is the object of this conversation. And leads, uh, you know, the way the Baptists used to teach me about it, leads the uh, Ethiopian official to Christ. And that was the way the story sort of ended when I was a kid. But Luke makes a point of saying that that Ethiopian wasn't just a black man from South Nile, the southern, uh, uh, yeah, southern precincts of the Nile, but that he was also a eunuch. Anybody here want to talk about circumcision? Circumcision gone wrong? Um, this is an adult class, so it's okay, right, if I talk like this. You know what a eunuch is? According to um, De Deuteronomy, according to Leviticus, uh, a person whose um, private parts, his genitals, have been um, damaged, either on purpose or by accident, is not allowed to be a member of the assembly in worship. Let that sink in for a little while. We have a man, according to Luke, who has just come from the temple precincts, and he wants to know about Isaiah and figure out who this Isaiah is. And he's a man, by definition, is excluded from ever being a worshiper, uh, uh, um, allowed to be in the precincts of the court. And Philip's job is to teach him that this man um, is, can be a follower of Jesus Christ. And what does the unit ask? He asks if he can be baptized and included into the assembly of Christ. And you see how the longer um, or the bigger uh, geographical area has, how the geographical reach of the gospel is being enlarged. And so we have not just Peter, but we have Philip and we have uh, uh, others who, um, um, 
begin to realize that the reach of the gospel, the reach of the of the spirit, is not just limited to a Jewish batch of people, but it's much more inclusive. And it's the actual sign of the spirit is its inclusivity. It's reaching out. Ty, Pastor Tyler, yesterday, when you were talking about the reach, I can't do it on the, on the camera, right? But the reach of the gospel, the reach the reaching out and allowing yourself to be vulnerable so that the spirit can move so that you can understand. Um, who, well, you just did a great job, by the way. Um, I'll let you pay me later. So what's the next story that Luke tells? He tells the story My apologies. Oh, I was going to point out, this is one of those things that, just for those of you who want to investigate a little bit further, it's really interesting to me that the passage that said that the, uh, the passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy 23, that says that the unit cannot go, cannot be a member of the assembly, is in Deuteronomy, whereas the... Um, the passage that says, you know, um, you, um, if any of your children uh, have broken testicles, then, or if the member is cut off, they cannot be priests. This really interesting to me that Deuteronomy, which is the second law, the Deuteronomy, which is the 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 version of the law that was written down honor about the time of the exile, whereas the Levitical law is much older. The older law says that Aaron's children must be perfect when they minister at the, at the, at the temple or in the, at the tabernacle. They cannot be damaged goods. They cannot even be blemished. Their skin must be clean. But by the time it comes around to the exile, it's not just the priest who must be clean. It is the... Um, it is, everybody must be clean. And you see that it is the, the hallmark of the Pharisee that since the time of the exile and the return of the exiles, there's been this growing definition of what it requires in order for you to be saved, what it is required for you to fit in, what is required, what God wants you to be. The holiness is getting bigger and bigger. This idea of a, a now I got to be careful there because I don't want to infer that we are not to be holy before God. But this this attrition, or the, what's the opposite of attrition? This slow growing addition to the expectation, so that it's no longer just faith in Christ, but it's also going back and making sure that you look like Moses' law. And not just Moses' law, but that you are better than Moses, kind of like that preset that was happening at um, at the time of the return from exile. If you don't agree with me, if you don't think that's right, read Ezra and Nehemiah again. And read it with the idea of looking into Ezra and Nehemiah, both of them saying, Lord, I did my best, and I'm sorry that they misunderstood. Anyway, so the next story that Luke tells is the story of Cornelius. First, Cornelius. We have this picture of Cornelius, who? A Roman, a Roman military man, a military man high up. In his, in his regimen, is praying because he's seeking after God and he's, in, he's impressed with the way that the Jews do things. And he is given this angelic message telling him to go hunt out Peter and have a conversation with him. Peter has the vision where the sheep comes down with animals that you're not allowed to eat, you're not allowed to... Um, uh, to be around. And the irony of him living in uh, the Tanner's house, Tanner's 
are people who take animals and take their skins and help use the skins for leather and things like that, which means that um, the tanner is ritually um, unclean. And Peter's in the tanner's house, which means that Peter is ritually unclean. And Peter has this vision that says, it is not that you touched a dead body. It's not that you're eating the wrong things. It's the way that the spirit moves in you and reaches out and includes people and loves people uh, into, into uh, the kingdom. I'm going a little faster now because I know some of you are getting concerned. How's he going to make it by the hour? Um, so Peter has this experience and he's floored that when uh, Cornelius' household hears the good news, that their reality is as real, their understanding of the spirit is as real to them as his own was at Pentecost. And so the geographical uh, uh, region the, the, the breadth, it's not just growing from Judea into uh, Caesarea. It's not just growing um, larger by geographical. It's growing by a cultural connection. It's leaving the Jewish homeland behind, and it's becoming more tied to the, um, not tied, not tied at all. It's inclusive of the people who are, um, uh, the conquerors, the invaders, the oppressors. What is this thing that the Spirit um, is building that includes all of these people from all over the from all over the region, and now apparently even reaching into the Italian regiment, e e even well. So. The next thing that we hear is the story about how um, the church has been, because of the, uh, of, um, I didn't mention in there, this was, would have been way back there a few years earlier, um, when Stephen was murdered, the church dispersed. According to Luke, most of the people left town, all but the apostles and a few coterie, a little coterie of people around him. Maybe the church grew after that. The, certainly the power and the influence of the, of the church in Jerusalem was outsized. But most of the Christians moved out of town. And in particular, uh, Luke says that they went to Antioch. Antioch is really interesting and overlooked in our culture today. We don't think much about Antioch very often. We think in terms of Rome, and then there might have been um, Byzantium, you know, where the Eastern Orthodox is uh, uh, headquartered. Um, uh, sometimes people will mention a Coptic church, but we don't think very much about Antioch. Antioch was the center of Christianity by the time, well, at least as important as Jerusalem, and its influence among the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, among the, the, um, the Gentiles, was uh, it was a trade center. Let me tell you a little few more things about Antioch. Antioch was founded by Seleucus I. Seleucus I was one of the four generals that succeeded Alexander the Great. When Alexander died, they divided his, um, uh, his empire into four sections. The Seleucids were the, the terrible people, were the horribly cruel people that tried to control the Jews and are the reason or the motivation for the awful things that happened during the Maccabean revolt. Uh, Seleucus founded Antioch. It was a great place since it had its little position right here where the Orontes River uh, uh, left the steppes in, in, um, in what was then Aram. Um, and it was kind of a launching pad if you wanted to go uh, to Turkey or if you wanted to go on to um, Italy or, or Greece. 
it was a great place to connect, or if you wanted to go east to Persia and to uh, Parthia and other parts of the world, it was a great toll booth, just as effective as Jerusalem had been from north to south. And so it became, by the time of Jesus' day, it became the third largest city in the Mediterranean, only behind Alexandria and Rome. By the time um, first century comes along, it may be, have even eclipsed Alexandria in Egypt. So it was an important city. It was founded as Seleucus' capital. It was the it was the capital of all the uh, all the Greeks who controlled Jerusalem and Damascus and all the places south under the Seleucid Empire. And in 69 uh, BC, when Rome uh, got involved. They made that the capital, that the capital of the Roman province, including Judea. Um, Antioch is the place where Christians were first called Christians. Pastor uh, John mentioned that last week. There's more to Antioch, too. Um, Antioch is in that region of the Bible, is in that region of Asia Minor that... Um, uh, the Bible calls Aram, A-R-A-M, Aram. And you know of Abraham, who is a, was a wandering Aramean. And Aram is that countryside that, that uh, um, uh, is connected or, or is covers the whole uh, crescent from Babylon all the way north of Israel, of of, uh, of Canaan. It, Aram is the reason why we talk about Jesus' language was not Hebrew, his language was not Greek, his, um, his family language, his birth language was probably Aramaic. The church at Antioch uh, wrote down the scriptures, and there are some who say that the Aramaic uh, New Testament is as old, if not older, than the Greek New Testament that you and I know about. Um, one of the things that really surprised me is that in the Aramaic New Testament, the, the um, Lord's Prayer is a poem that rhymes with itself. It's a feature you don't read when you read it in Greek. So you see how old Antioch is. It was the center of Christianity for centuries and in some ways um, vied for the primacy that um, Rome uh, tried to exert on the church. So it was in Antioch that there was this group of people who um, had a very powerful Christian experience. The people in Antioch uh, seem to be doing well. I'm going to tell a personal story. I had a, I served as pastor a few times for a few churches. And I had this experience um, of falling in love with my congregation. Um, when you fall in love with your congregation, it happens by little piece, by little piece, by little piece, or it did to me. I didn't realize that I was growing like a, like a father might be, proud of what my children are doing, not because I did anything in particular, not because I had managed them so well, but because, or that I taught them so well, but because they were, I, I could watch the way that they were taking care of each other and they were loving each other. And during the good times of my pastoral experience, it was wonderful to watch the spirit work among people. But there was this day when I noticed that um, a person in our congregation uh, had decided that um, uh, she had a special blessing from God, and she had a prophetic voice, and that she had a uh, um, she had a, an ability to know what God was really saying, not just through the scriptures, but, you know, like 
uh, from your mouth to God's ears or maybe from God's mouth to your ears kind of a way. She had a special insight and uh, many people believed her. It happens. That kind of thing happens and you kind of live with that. You kind of roll with it when you're the pastor. Somebody has an insight and you listen to them and you love them, try to love them as well as anybody else. But one day, one of the other ladies in the congregation um, told me that she was dying of cancer. And I was not ready for it. I w was not happy about it, as you could imagine. She wasn't either. She was terrified. She was terrified that she was going to die and God wasn't going to take her home to him, but that she had been so bad that in her early life that, that maybe she just needed to have a little bit more um, faith. And my friend who thought of herself as a, as a prophet told my friend who had cancer, if you just believe, if you just have more faith, uh, if you could just trust God that he will heal you, he will heal you. And as my friend got sicker and sicker and sicker, uh, my prophet friend kept telling her, if only you would believe, you would be saved. Well, I got to be in the room when my friend who was sick finally died. It was a privilege to be with her. But she was terrified to the end. You couldn't tell her enough because the evidence in front of her was that she was not going to be saved. So personally, I have a little um, insight or I feel strongly that um, it must have been very difficult for Paul and Barnabas and the other leaders in the church to see this church that they love so much being devastated by people who said, it's not Jesus. It's not just Jesus. It's not faith in what he has done for you, but that you must also be uh, a believer in Moses. You must have the gospel and. So they went down to Jerusalem. I'm, I won't take very long to say what's coming next. They went down to Jerusalem and they pled their case. And in Jerusalem, there was a group of people who still insisted and just as boldly said, yes, you can be a follower of Jesus, but you also must be circumcised. You must be a follower of Moses. That's what Phariseeism is, is where you tell people that they must become holy so that the Spirit will come back. You must be righteous enough for God to be in your life. And the Paul, first Paul and Barnabas said, no, no, no. What Jesus has done is enough. The text tells us that Peter agreed that he also had experienced the way that the love of Jesus, the Jesus that Jesus loved, that the work of Jesus, both as an example and as a savior, um, is what's needed. And that is enough. And then of all people, the most conservative, the most at, who had the, the, the man who had the most at stake to retain uh, the status of a, of a leader in Jerusalem, he also agreed that Jesus' uh, sacrifice, Jesus' love is enough, the kind of love that reaches out and reaches everybody. They only had four conditions. This is James talking. They only had four things that James was still worried about. One was, don't eat food sacrificed to idols. As far as the Jews were concerned, that's okay. 
they had Yahweh. They didn't really get that concerned about the, they had their own sacrificial system. They didn't get upset about the food that was sacrificed to idols. It was the Gentiles who were upset about the food, the meat that was tainted by its gift to the, to the local God, to the idol. And to the Jew, eating that food, eating, eating something that you got a discount at the market, was not a big deal. But if you were going to sit at the same table with the Jew, it would be something very, very hard to do if you were a Gentile. And so, James, Peter, Paul, agree and tell Antioch, don't make this separation between you. Don't, don't make it a topic of conversation at dinner. Oh, where did you get this meat? But minister to each other. Keep that off of the conversation list. And just eat with each other. He talks about that uh, don't eat strangled meat. Don't eat anything made with blood. That was a concession to the Jews because the life is in the blood to the Jews. Strangling the meat in order to uh, make dinner was a thing done all over the Roman Empire, but not in Judea. And so uh, a Jew trying to eat at a, at a Gentile's house would have thrown up a lot in their mouth at the thought of having dinner with strangled meat or uh, food made with blood or made from blood. And then, of course, everybody could agree. Let's not do it like they do up in the Roman court. Let's not do it like they do in the, in the uh, Hasmonean court. Let's not do it like they do it in all the elite houses. But let's have a, a, a morality of the way that we treat each other that is kind and pure. Let us help get along. You know... The Council of Jerusalem was no more successful uh, at uniting the church than any other council since then. But it is a wonderful description of how folks like you and me did, our abs did their absolute best to take care of each other and to minister to each other to invite each other to each other's homes. We can't do that so much, I guess, in the COVID times. But there are ways that we can reach out. And again, Pastor, uh, like you said, reach our hands completely out and include, yes, being vulnerable to include people that are not pretty, that don't do it like we do, who um, maybe even by Moses standards couldn't be included uh, but they are people that need to know not only that Jesus loves them, but that we do too. Do I hear an amen? I hope. Well, they're unmuted now, so they can say amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 <laughs> Okay, I've gone over my hours, so we, uh, I'm not sure you want to ask me any questions, but I I will be available. Is that okay, Pastor? Sure. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I think you covered it so well. We don't have questions. <laughs> Done. So you fine. did a fine job. Yeah. You know, in terms yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, so in Acts 15 gets isolated from the context. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier part of the book of Acts, so often in our minds, we tend to have, you know, you read one chapter and you don't connect it with, with the whole story. And uh, I know that next week, Tyler's going to talk to us about the, the whole story. And um, you really set him up. Uh, you lobbed very well in explaining how uh, central, and Luke puts it right in the middle of the book of Acts, right? Right. It's a central event. And you showed how it was central, uh, how the context led up to it, 
And uh, in the last bit you said it, which I love, I don't believe I ever had an entirely successful congregational meeting where there was no discussion about anything that came up in the entirety of my ministry. And um, this didn't settle things. Uh, didn't You can see that in 1 Corinthians, for instance. In 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, this food dedicated to idols was still provoking a lot of discussion. But um, really, that was a fine job of setting up the context so we could understand the concept. Well. Thanks, Bill. Do you want to tell us now what happened after you dropped the uh, the C bomb in the uh, in the relish tray? <laughs> yeah, uh, all I remember now, I mean, you know, that that has it's <laughs> many years ago. What I remember now is the <laughs> the stunned silence. It was just kind of I don't know. It was just an opportune moment, you know, like happens when you when people just suddenly stop talking for no reason <laughs> it was just like i <laughs> yep it was a moment it was a moment <laughs> memorable yeah <laughs> yeah kids, I have not the darnest, kids say the darnest things huh? <laughs> <laughs> i can just see your grandmother <laughs> explaining yeah. to her friends what's going on yeah, yeah. Um, if you knew her, she had a sort of a, a, I don't know how to describe, she had grown to the place where she, uh, she had grown to accustomed to the life that was expected of her. And so she could be a blue haired lady if she wanted to be. In her, in her private moment, she also had a kind of a tee -he, he ability. And um, I don't remember her explicit reaction to it. I just remembered the silence. The dead, <laughs> dead, dead silence. I wanted to hide underneath the couch. Oh, Thank you. That's a priceless story. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, just great, great dive into this. Yeah, into the council and, um, and such a just seeing the church wrestle with with this uh complicated question mm -hmm. yeah what a gift to uh to us today is the church because we have a few complicated questions of our own so um and i i, re I really do uh, to echo jim really appreciate how you you drew that together um and that no church cancel has has perfectly answered any question but they're doing the best they can to um take care of people and be faithful to God. All righty, everyone. We'll see you next week, if not sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.